Today, we're going to cover the fourth season episode, Night of a Thousand Devils. But we've got something really, really special that you're definitely not going to want to miss. Besides the fact that this episode is the send-off for Knight Rider's most important and most historically significant kit, it was also series producer Gino Grimaldi's one and only shot in the director's chair. And we're going to show you his personal binder filled with notes he took while filming this episode. It's a tremendous snapshot in time of one week's worth of Night Rider filming. You definitely don't want to miss it. All right, let's dig into Night of a Thousand Devils. <laughs> Production 60228, Night of a Thousand Devils. This episode was written by Peter Allen Fields and directed by Gino Grimaldi, one of the series producers. This episode originally aired on NBC Friday night, 8 p.m. on February 7th, 1986. It was filmed from January 6th through the 15th of 1986. It was the 79th episode to air, but the 80th to be produced. The synopsis reads as follows. Michael vows to find the man responsible when FBI friend is murdered during a raid. All right, let us dig in. All right, so we begin the episode here at uh, Becker's house, which is actually on Dry Canyon Cold Creek Road in Calabasas, California. This guy right here is Bruce Neckles. We talked to Bruce many years ago about his role um, and how he got this up, this uh, role in this episode. Um, he said he had done a series pilot for Universal Studios in San Francisco in 1977, and Gino Grimaldi was one of the producers. When Gino told me he was going to direct a Knight Rider episode, I told him that I wanted to be in his very first show that he directed. Night of a Thousand Devils was his directing debut. The cast and crew respected him. He knew the show very well, and he was the producer from the very beginning. Gino was all business and very much in control. Gino and I um, were best friends. Well, he said our best friends at the time, but unfortunately Gino has passed. Um, but he says best friends, and we just completed a screenplay together. Years ago, I became an ordained minister, and when Gino found out about it, he asked me to perform his daughter's wedding ceremony. So that's pretty neat. And one other tidbit that uh, Bruce Neckles shares with us is um, even though this is his only appearance in the flesh in Knight Rider, he said he did do voiceovers in other episodes. He said the casting directors liked my voice and brought me in for several other episodes to do voiceovers, which was a lot of fun. So now we get to play a game. How many of you guys can find some samples of Bruce Neckles' voiceovers in other Knight Rider episodes? No, we don't know offhand. I This is one of those things where we just never delve into it. But maybe you guys can, you know, do some digging in other Knight Rider episodes, figure out where you hear his voice. Um, and as for this, the Becker house, which you can see in the background here, let's take a look at it today. So there's the uh, gate. So we're off to the side here. So Kit was parked right here. Interestingly enough, look, this road takes a sharp curve around there, but the house is right here, still looking pretty much the same as it did back in 86. All right, and we have Becker here, Jonathan Goldsmith. Um, he went on to play his probably most famous role, the Dos Equis guy, the most interesting man in the world in the Dos Equis commercials um, from a few years ago. I don't think he plays them anymore, but um, that was him, Ronald Becker. All right, so nothing to say here except for the fact let's just take a moment and admire R.C.'s low-cut sweater. Wonder if he still wonder if Peter Paris still has the sweater. Maybe he should wear it the next time he comes to a Night Rider show. That'd be awesome. All right, and here we have Kathy Shower playing the role of uh, Miss Claudia Torrell. Kathy was uh, the Playboy Playmate of the year or of the month in 1985 at some point. 
um, according to her Wikipedia page. And this episode has a number of um, Playboy Playmates in it. So if you're into that sort of thing, check this episode out. Um, there you go. All right, so next up we've got Michael pulling into um, Claudia's warehouse or business, whatever. So this is actually, or was at the time, Whiteman Enterprises on Pierce Street in Pacoima, California. If you look at this house in the background, so you see this this house, you got a flat window here, you've got a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not bulged out. You know what I mean. The uh, bump out, a bump out window there. So if we look at it today, this is where that all took place. And if we turn around here, there's that same house. There's the flat window. There's the bumped out window. So Kit was pulling in right here, and that's where they filmed this scene on Pierce Street. So interestingly, so right here, this is where that the scene I was just talking about was filmed right here. Interestingly enough, so Kit was pulling in um, like right here, one of these he was pulling in. But anyways, um, interestingly enough, Oh, I'm sorry. No, he's pulling in right here. I knew I was off a little bit. So Kit was pulling in right here. Interestingly enough, behind that building is Whiteman Airport. And this is the same airport used in the climax of uh, Night of the Juggernaut. Pretty neat. It's, who knew it was like all right there? All right, so we're back in the semi. RC is working on his bike. This is one of just a couple episodes where we see his bike. Um, where else? We saw it in Killer Kit. We see it here. We see it again in Voodoo Night. Um, is that it? Because in this episode, so in Killer Kit, his bike was fine by the end of the episode. In this episode, um, it gets damaged whenever he leaps off of it towards the end of the episode to stop a bad guy. In Voodoo Night, it's left behind when the building uh, is demolished. So um, hard life for this bike for sure. All right, so now we are at uh, the start of the Baja race, supposedly. This is, in reality, Canyon Country, Sierra Highway. Um, I always remember, even as a kid, I recognized this building because it always had this horseshoe on it, a very distinct horseshoe. This is the same location that we saw back in Merchants of Death. We saw um, Kit and Michael parking in here. Let me show you. There you go. So this is from Merchants of Death, and this was the bar that uh, you know Michael was going to. He was undercover, and he was going in here. But there's that same horseshoe building right there. So what does it look like today? Is the building still there? Yes, it is. It's right here. It almost looks like a house now. And um, this is where Michael and Kit drove through, and the horseshoe was right here. Unfortunately, it's gone. If I ever win like the lottery, maybe I'll go buy this house and put the horseshoe back on. That'd be really cool. All right, so this episode marks the premiere, I guess you could say, of a sharper voice box. I don't know if you ever noticed these, these last few episodes of the series, whenever you see the insert dash, see these close-up shots, the, the curves and the angles are so much more crisp. Um, I think they did an overhaul on the insert dash, which would be my guess. So just to give you an idea, let's compare um, this episode versus the previous episode. All right, so here you can see the previous episode, and you see how, and or maybe it's just the lighting, but you see how things just look a little less crisp, all right? So there's that, and look at it here. Look at the, the lines around the, um, you know, the, the bevel right here, and the, and the shape, and, and again, maybe it's just the uh, lighting. Let's see here, but I don't think so. I think... Let's even look at the wording. So look at these letters on here. So SAT, see how the S is separated a little bit from the AT? Is that over here too? See, no, it's not. I think they redid all of this. So oil temp, see that's it's off center there, not off center there. And you can tell that the, the transfers they used were not as crisp. So they, they did some touch up on the insert dash for this episode um, that you'd see in the, the remaining couple episodes of the show. All right, so we're going to deviate just slightly from our normal episode commentary to bring you something very special. And that very sub special something is what's in this binder. Um, 
Night of a Thousand Devils was directed by series producer Gino Grimaldi. I'm sure you recognize the name. You've seen his name in the credits of the show for many years. Now, unfortunately, Gino passed away um, a number of years ago, but um, a couple years ago, we made contact with his family and they ended up uh, gifting us all of Gino's Knight Rider related uh, paraphernalia to include his original binder for this director's binder for this episode for Knight Rider, property of MCA. So I thought as a special treat, we'll take just a couple minutes and kind of go through this binder because it's amazing. It really is. So first of all, there's all these loose papers in here. We've got um, Knight Rider, the series, cast, staff, and crew list, September 14th, 1982. So this was before it even aired. All of the uh, important names, their extension at Universal, their phone numbers, second season, second season revised, Third season, or I'm sorry, that's fourth season. I think third season is in here. Yeah, there's third season. Fourth season, just really, really cool. And as a bonus, there's other non-Night Rider related crew lists in here. Midnight Lace, these are things Gino worked on. Joe Dancer 2, whatever that is. Condominium from 1979. The Rebels, 1979. The Rebels, Midnight Lace, another condominium. The Rebels, The Immigrants. So just really, really neat snapshot of, there's the Babysitters, whatever that is. Um, really, really uh, cool stuff there. All right, so let's see what else is in here. The ratings for the show. So this is from January 9th, 1986. And national ratings. Let's see here if Knight Rider's on here. I'm sure it is somewhere. Yeah, Knight Rider. For the 9 to 9.30 slot, there's the demos for, looks like San Francisco, Phoenix, Boston, D.C. The shares it got, I'm assuming, and what the average is. So you can see by the fourth season, Knight Rider, for its time slot, was last but behind different strokes in Dallas. And same with the 932 10 slot. There's Airwolf. There's a whole bunch of uh, interesting bits on these pages. Um, yeah, and then we get information on all the uh, guest stars and their you know home phone numbers and all that stuff. Um, yeah, there's information on Gino's contract to direct this episode. Uh, how much he got paid. We've got the crew sheets the, or the call sheets for this episode, where they're going to film, what days, addresses. There's even some crew maps in here. Really, 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 really neat stuff. I need to scan all this. And then we get into the script itself with all of Gino's um, handwriting here. Look, he put estimated time 50 minutes, 34 seconds, plus more time in script. I think the episode was end, end, ended up being like 48 minutes, but you can see here all these notes. He writes so small. It's neat, but it's small. So um, I'm just kind of give you guys a, a look at all of this. I've never taken the time to really go through and read all of his various notes. I really want to, but um, just keeps going. Every single page has tons of notes. This is this was his guide for directing the episode. Just really, really, really cool. Let's see what else is in here. I haven't looked at this book in years, and I've only briefly looked at it. So what do we have back here? Night of a Thousand Devils kit lines. So what you're looking at here, this is... This is what William Daniels would have been handed to record his lines at the studio. That's my guess. So look at this. Re-recorded January 15th, 1986. So it looks like maybe it was recorded originally January 13th of 86, re-recorded the 15th. And look, it's just... Um, his wristwatch, wristwatch indicates he's right there with you, Michael. And look at these hash marks. I bet you this is the number of takes they did for each one of those lines to get just the inflections they were looking for from Kit. Uh, 
I don't think we, uh, I don't think we've ever seen one of these before. This is the only time I've ever seen one of these. So these are all the kit lines. So William Daniels would go into his booth with those pages. And here's another staff crew list. And then these are alternate pages from earlier script revisions. And you can see scenes that were cut. This really, really neat stuff here. Anything else hidden back here? Yeah, just a whole bunch of cut scenes or, or maybe these aren't cut scenes. Maybe they're scenes that were filmed. I don't know. I'd have to look closer, but there you go. There is uh, just a quick look at Gino Grimaldi's personal binder for directing this episode. All right. So uh, Michael is summoning Kit. Kit's getting, he's boxed in right by my favorite horseshoe building here. A couple things to note. First of all, if we look off to the left here, we can see one of the Universal Studios vans has a has a uh, cola sign on it. But here's one of their vans, the uh, Comtron style vans. I think we saw this exact one way back in the pilot. Uh, also, this is the left-hand blind drive car. You can just barely see the twin TVs in here because they, again, moved the Hero Dash from the original Hero car into this car at the start of season three. For those of you curious, there were six Trans Ams used in this episode to portray Kit, and they are, obviously, the left-hand blind drive car here, the season three and four hero car, the right-hand blind drive car, we've got the hardtop stunt car, the same one we've had since season one, our general purpose T-top stunt car that got introduced at the beginning of season three, and finally, the Season 4 Insert Car. There are your six Trans Ams used as kit in this episode. All right, so we have this scene where Michael's unconscious. He gets thrown into a uh, hole in the ground. This all was filmed at Universal Studios back lot near their Falls Lake at the time. I don't think any of this is still there. It's probably been redeveloped, but this was all back lot Universal stuff. All right, so in the background here, You've got um, obviously some of these Baja racers, but right here, this guy, anybody know who this guy is? Here, I'll give you a better look at him right here. Who's this guy? You guys know? That is famed car customizer Jay Orberg making a, uh, I guess you could say a cameo appearance. Um, he would go on to build the Knight Rider 2000 car, the Knight 4000. There he is in the original show. So take a look at this. This is that general purpose T-top stunt car. Nice close-up shot with uh, the grappling hook being lowered down. And um, take a look at this. This is a fiberglass front nose. But look at all the cracks in the paint here. And it's funny because the surviving Knight Rider cars today, the ones that still have their 15 or 20 coats of original paint, all have these spiderweb cracks on them. Um, but it's interesting to see them, you know, Th th there were cracks on them back during filming as well because this car was used heavily heavily in season three and season four so it probably already at this point has a dozen paint jobs on it and you can see all the cracks from those paint jobs you can even see it here in the uh, lip of the fog lights and this um the fog lights look interesting they must look fake don't they i don't think they are but that's uh, kind of weird this is one of only two cars that still has the season three nose on it by season four. All right, and check this out. This is that hardtop stunt car, but um, notice how much the front nose is drooping in this scene. Look at it. Look how it just kind of falls off here. And you can even notice it here. Like the whole front end is just drooping. So this front nose is made out of rubber, rubber and chicken wire. And there's aluminum um, brackets behind it that are that were um, grafted into the nose that are supposed to bolt on to the Trans Am um, crash bar underneath it, the factory Trans Am crash bar. What I think happened here is those brackets the, that um, are supposed to bolt in, at least the ones in the center, I don't think they were bolted in or something, something happened along those lines where there's no support in the middle. And it has to be those brackets. That's the only thing I can think of. So I'm thinking those were not bolted in and that's causing the rubber, the rubber nose to sag because back then these noses were still fairly new. They were only a few months old at this point. So they were still very pliable. Um, the surviving rubber front noses today are as hard as fiberglass um, because they're 40 years old, 35 years old. But uh, back then they would have been more pliable. So that's what you're seeing here. The whole front end is just drooping on this car.
All right, so next up, we've got uh, more Playboy Playmates. So I think, yeah, four of them total in this episode. There's three of them here and then Kathy Shower from earlier. Anyways, this is the scene, obviously, where Michael stops. Their car broke down. And, you know, as a Knight Rider historian, I'm going to focus on the bits of kit you can see and not the Playboy Playmates because that's what we do here. Um, so this is, you can tell this is the hardtop stunt car. And you can even see the this giant honking um, overhead console it had, which was a really unique shape. It was never, it was one built specifically for a hardtop car. Uh, looks like we can see the mount for a sun visor here. And something else interesting, this door panel. So this is an all vinyl door panel, which was an option on cars, at least 82, 1982 cars. I don't know about other, I don't know if 83 had the all vinyl also, but um, 82 definitely did. And you can tell that this is, this was option. So what does that tell us? That tells us maybe this car came with an all vinyl interior and not cloth originally, or this is a door panel from another car. We know the um, season three and four hero car originally came from the factory with a vinyl PMD interior. So this could very well be the door panel from that car. I mean, hard to say. They did a lot of parts swapping during the four years the show was on the air. What's more interesting is then they turn to this angle, and this is a completely different car. Um, this is the, uh, the hero car on this side. But you go back here, and this is a different car. You can see no T-top and T-top. All right, it's time, hold your tears back or get your Kleenex. It is time to say goodbye to this kit. The right-hand blind drive car, originally the season one and two hero car, the original car that Michael Chaffee built his dash and installed in this car. This is the last time we see this car on the show. Interestingly enough, it's not even being used as a blind drive car in this scene. There's someone just driving it as a normal car. But um, yeah, unfortunately, this is the end of the line for the right-hand blind drive car. Fortunately, this is one of the five cars that still exists to this day. Goodbye, right-hand blind drive car. All right, so next scene, this is that hardtop stunt car, and it looks like they fixed the front bumper from those earlier scenes, or this was filmed before the front bumper got all whacked out. But um, look at the scanner opening. This is this is common in the season four bumpers because when Barris built this front nose, he made the scanner opening basically too tall. So the scanner bars always had a giant gap in here, which you can see. I mean, you know, it doesn't look bad on film, really, and, and for drive-bys, but if you were to stand in front of this car, you'd see just how much of a gap there is right here between the top of the scanner and the hood. All right, and I think this is the only time in the series where Michael gives his comlink to someone else. So we see RC using Michael's comlink, um, which is kind of cool. It's the first and only time we ever see that. All right, so now we're at Delorca's place, which is supposed to be in Mexico, right? But in reality, this house is less than uh, four miles from Becker's house, which we saw at the beginning of this episode. So you can see here there's a big, windy driveway, house at the top of the hill. And unfortunately, the house is no longer there. In fact, it looks like it was recently demolished. Some of it looks like maybe a pond is still here and, and a... A patio but the house is completely gone i don't know if it was you know damaged in a fire or people were just tearing it down to build something bigger there but what's really interesting is if we zoom out and we go across the street we're at the king gillette ranch which is uh alvin kincaid's compound in inside out right there right across the street from delorca's house and Delorca is getting a pounding from Kit here, uh, left-hand blind drive car. Take a look at this rear quarter. Hits the guy. Look at that big dent that the stuntman put in the fender right here. It's all in a day's work for these cars. They were all patched together anyways. All right, episode ends. We're back in the semi. RC's trying to repair his bike. And look at this as we zoom out. You can actually see the, the wall has been removed. If you look in this bottom corner here, the wall should be right here. You can see it's gone. This is part of the sound stage. Um, and up here, you know, normally that wall would be right here. 
but instead you see kind of what's behind those pieces. And do you guys know what this is right here? This is actually that Venetian blind, this blind right here. This is the other piece of that blind. So on a few episodes, we see those blinds opening and closing. They just pulled them out of the way so they wouldn't obscure the, uh, the view of the actors. How about that? All right, guys, we have officially completed Night of a Thousand Devils. Not a bad episode. I mean, there are better, but not a bad episode. We're down to our final five after this. Next up is Hills of Fire, then Night Flight to Freedom, Fright Night, Night of the Rising Sun, and Voodoo Night, and then we are done with our episode commentaries. I hope you'll join us for these last five. They're sure to be adequate at best. They're not the best episodes. As always, thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this, and we'll catch you next time.